So today we'll be talking about the best practices for tree injection. These are based on the best management practices published by uh, the International Society of Arboriculture. Uh, and thanks to Tom Smiley, who's worked with us to, to put out a second edition, and a lot of the inclusions in the second edition of that issue are presented in this presentation. So. move on with this. <clears throat> Next. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, why, why use tree injection? Um, <clears throat> the types of tree in, injection tools that are used in the trade, um, reactions, tree reactions, and responses to tree injection. <clears throat> and some application considerations, <clears throat> things that you ought to know about when injecting trees, application timing, pest biology, susceptibility, treatment formulation, residual activity, tree phenology, what the tree is doing, environmental conditions, time of day, and administering uh, injections, uh, just the practical aspects, measuring the tree, um, many labels are based on tree diameter, mixing and dosing, drilling the injection holes, those techniques we'll speak a little bit about, the injection location, where to inject trees, and the actual process of injecting the tree. So why tree injection? In some cases, tree injection is the most effective way to treat a specific insect or disease problem. So think about things like vascular wilt diseases, such as Dutch elm disease. They are internal to the tree and move rapidly within the tree system. Oak wilt's another example. There are bacterial and phytoplasma diseases, <coughs> things like lethal yellows, Texas Phoenix palm decline, which was recently introduced from Texas into Florida, uh, that spread rapidly. <coughs> another systemic disease, um, bacterial leaf scorch, fire blight, these are bacterial. Uh, those you may well be familiar with. And some under bark feeders, Emerald ash borer certainly <clears throat> is in the news these days. It's uh, fairly widespread, especially through the Midwest, but pretty much everywhere in the States and into Canada where uh, green and white ash grow. Uh, and uh, pine bark beetles, <clears throat> uh, we are doing some work with mountain pine beetle, western pine beetle, spruce beetle, and so forth. Uh, because they're not uh, some of these insects and um, part of their life cycles or diseases that are not easily controlled by topical application sprays, uh, tree injection offers an opportunity to um, treat those trees. So there are two basic methods of pressurized tree injection. One is called macro injection. Uh, our term is microinfusion, which we trademark. And the second is microinjection. So some of the microinjection uh, devices are like the Moje cap um, or our <coughs> uh, QuickJet, uh, QuickJet, and QuickJet Air. <coughs> so types of tree injection is macro injection systems. Those typically deliver a quart or more solution <coughs> to multiple injection points uh, from a common reservoir and are pressurized by pumps or compressed gas. So that's the general mode of a macro infusion system. The advantage is that the dilute Solution may be inject, injected, so what is uh, so you can reduce phytotoxicity. Uh, you can manage that and increase dis distribution in the tree canopy. That means you're dropping the viscosity, which may make it a little faster, but basically increase distribution in the canopy. <clears throat> so some of the micro injection devices are smaller volumes, so these are more concentrate. They're not diluted. And um, there are a couple of modes there that are typically used. Um, so um, some are preloaded, like the uh, individualized self-pressuring and, and pre-measured capsules, like the Moje cap. Uh, these are loaded with materials that generally have lower phytotoxicity. Um, some are handheld guns, like the, uh, the QuickJet uh, Air that is uh, figured, is uh, pictured here, <coughs> and with that is operated by a trigger mechanism to deliver the chemical into the tray. So <clears throat> whenever you drill into trees, there's always the potential. Uh, drilling into a tree creates a wound, um, and there's always a potential for 
uh, off, off side things to happen, like insects or pathogens, to gain entry into that uh, into the bowl of the tree. C certain trees tolerate that well. Um, that is partly under genetic control. Um, partly it has to do with the health of the tree, its environment in which it grows. So um, <clears throat> generally, you know, we recommend um, kind of a proactive approach to treating trees. Uh, the healthier the trees, the better the outcome. Here is it pictured on the right is an application site three, three years after treatment in ash. Um, this was treated for EAB. So one indication of wound tolerance is the rate of compartmentalization. So internal sap damage is usually observed when the tree is removed. Uh, we observe a lot because we intentionally do tree autopsies to look at um, what Arvijit does is look at phytotoxicity of formulations in order to mitigate the off-site effects. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the things that we do. The other thing that we do uh, is look at the efficacy, you know, how effective is it against a target organism. But generally, uh, an applicator will, will see damage when the tree is removed or externally by looking at whether or not the wound uh, wound closure is complete at the injection site. So that's a non-destructive way of, of assessing it. Tree wounds can be created basically in two different ways. One is by physically, by physical pressure. If your injector is not set properly, you can crack the bark. So high pressure applications you have to take a little caution with, and so I'm gonna spend a little time talking about that because you can physically do damage. More typically, you'll, once you are a pro at injecting, it's really the chemical phytotoxicity that may cause the issues. And the image here to the right is an ash that was injected. Uh, it was, this, was, this autopsy was, was done three years after the injection with, this particular, with a particular formulation. It wasn't ours, but it was a formulation that caused phytotoxicity to the inner bark, and those yellow arrows indicate how much the cambium, the lateral cambium was burned, uh, and the tree couldn't respond to that. It's beginning to respond, but it, it, it often takes, a, uh, well, it certainly took more, it took at least three years and maybe more for it to actually close over. So you want to be aware of that. So <clears throat> not only there's, is there an indication or the event of sapwood or vascular phytotoxicity uh, to the cambial tissues, the inner bark, but um, some products can cause uh, phytotoxicity to the, to the foliage. And this is what you're probably more likely to see. Um, in the canopy, you'll see um, some damage to the, to the foliage that expresses itself as marginal leaf scorch or intravenal necrosis or leaf drop and defoliation. Usually this can occur uh, in a relatively short period of time, anywhere from three days to a week after treatment. Um, the, where I've seen it most often was with uh, applications of micronutrients, and I've seen it most often when uh, it's just right uh, when trees are actually actively growing in the springtime. So applications with, with nutrients, which are basically in solution or salts, uh, can cause a burn to the foliage. So I've seen that happen in, in birches, and I've seen that happen in maples. And for that reason, we often recommend um, applications for micronutrients, especially in the uh, Midwest, of this, uh, the Midwestern states, where pHs tend to be high and, and, and iron and manganese is deficient. We tend to recommend that for fall, app fall application, where you're least likely to see that happen, or minimally after the foliage is hardened after spring, spring flush of growth. <clears throat> if that injury is relatively minor, the tree will refoliate, but uh, you may get some callbacks with customers if you burn some of their trees up in that same year. So product manufacturers do test for phytotoxicity. We do a lot of that here um, before uh, marketing their products. So always read the recommendations by the manufacturer, but they, we do put some work into, and other manufacturers do put some work into looking at this. And products that are not specifically labeled for tree injection shouldn't be used for tree injection. 
uh, labels the law for one thing, but more so uh, it's a question, too, of e efficacy. Um, we've gotten some um, negative reports back where people were trying to inject products that weren't even uh, very water-soluble um, uh, into the tree tissues, uh, especially in the Midwest for emerald ash borer. They claimed it was another product, it was a labeled product, and it just didn't work and trees, trees failed. Some of the products that are labeled um, are illustrated uh, to the right. So some of the Moshe products, there are other products on the market for tree injection, some of our reject products, obviously. Um, so use labeled products. <coughs> Effective tree injections um, are, uh, uh, to the applicator are relatively rapid. You know, it's nice to approach a tree, uh, administer the injection, in a few minutes you're done. So that's great. But that's only part of the story. Um, getting the material in the tree is important. Getting uniform in uh, distribution into canopy is even more important. And then finally, that canopy, that canopy distribution or that systemic distribution within the tree of that product has to be effective against your target organism, whether that's an insect, or a disease that you're trying to um, treat. So the timing uh, that of that event, that that infusion or injection, really depends on the tree species you're treating. Uh, conifers are different than diffuse porous trees, like maples are different from oaks. And I'll show you in a little bit why. It depends on the injection device. Injection devices vary in the input pressures and whether or not they require a dilution or not. The dosage, uh, the dosage is really driven by the label. The viscosity of the injected product, is, that varies. It depends on the product chemistry uh, in order to get it stable. And in a form, generally a solution, sometimes a micro, a micro emulsion, uh, to move into vascular tissues. So that, uh, that really weighs, uh, that drives viscosity. Tree health, as I said earlier, the healthier the tree, the more efficient or uh, more effective your, your uh, application will be, and environmental conditions, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So just an example of what we can do or what uh, manufacturers can do to get a uniform distribution into the canopy of the tree is how they configure their equipment. And one of the new configurations, just looking how to actually deliver uh, material through uh, a microinfusion system is to use uh, a manifold. And this hex manifold kind of minimizes that um, lack of uniformity in, in distributing as, a, as opposed to a, a daisy chain um, kind of arrangement. So this is from one point it goes into the distribution lines more evenly. So um, on the tree, tree anatomy side, I talked a little bit about this on uh, the last, my last uh, 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 webinar on uh, tree biology, but there are, uh, there's, por there's difference in porosity in tree types. There are ring porous trees, diffuse porous trees, and then there's non-porous trees, which are the conifers. So ring porous trees are things like oaks, elms, ash, that tend to have very large vessels. Not all oaks are equal, though. Uh, red oak, black oak, or, or trees in the red oak, black oak group, have pores that are open throughout the sapwood increment, that uh, growing increment, that uh, is, is not heartwood, it's active sapwood. It, tylos is a plugs these large vessels only after a trauma, after a wound. That's very different from white oak, which, which only has a year or two open vessels, and naturally tyloses. Um, just, that's its genetic programming. It tends to just plug up those older vessels. So the approach that you would take to inject a, a red or black oak is different from a white oak. Um, but relative to these to other species, diffuse porous tree uh, species like maples, and what's pictured here is a willow, which is semi-diffuse, tends to have smaller vessels, so it presents a barrier to uptake. And conifers have do not have vessels at all; they are totally reliant on tracheids, which are only a few microns across. 
So just picture the difference between trying to get um, material through a, a pipe as opposed to a capillary. And that <coughs> gives you a pretty good thumbnail sketch of the differences um, in time for uptake. So conifers are a bit of, uh, will expect to uh, um, take a little extra time with treating conifers. They have the added um, kind of curveball because they, some are, are um, resinous conifers. Those include spruces and pines. They tend to, um, if your uptake is really slow, that, that resin uh, is a natural defense mechanism. It'll tend to kind of goop up your uh, injectors if it takes a long time to uh, actually administer the, the injection. Um, so that's, those are a few things that you should be aware of. Uh, in terms of tree phenology, that is something that has to be taken into account. Um, where is your pest? What is the tree doing? I suggested a, l a little bit earlier that uh, if you're doing, uh, you're trying to treat for a nutrient deficiency, um, you know, wait until the tree is completely foliated, um, so late spring, early summer, or certainly in the fall to do nutrient applications. But always follow label recommendations for timing recommendations. And it and part of what's illustrated here is, you know, kind of assess the problem, assess where the tree is at, uh, you know, its susceptibility to the pest, where is the pest at. Um, so most, uh, most insects and pathogens that we do treat for have known life cycles. Uh, illustrated here are two, one's emerald ash borer on the left, on the right is Dutch elm disease, and the yellow hours indicate probably a good time to treat. Generally, you want to treat uh, before significant damage is done to the tree. In the case of ash, you want to get it as early as you can. Uh, uh, generally, flight of the insect, uh, the adults, occurs uh, uh, when uh, black locust blooms in your area, and about um, and generally when we've done work in the Midwest, many of the universities uh, entomologists like us to put uh, applications out 30 days prior to that emergence to kind of coordinate with having enough distribution in the plant to target that uh, uh, the the egg laying and uh, the mining from the larvae as early as possible. And that's one thing that you should think about uh, with products that are very short-lived in the tree is to, to coordinate that. Some products that are more long-lived, it's less of an issue, but yet you, you want to be proactive with some of these things because you want to minimize vascular damage, and that's the biggest issue with both emerald ash borer and this other example, Dutch elm disease. So the yellow arrow on the right uh, is where that <coughs> insect, which is a scolitid, a bark beetle, that feeds uh, in crotches of elm uh, branches, it will transmit spores of the causal agent, you know, it's Ophistoma nova homi, uh, and you want to, uh, if, especially if you're using products, systemic fungicides, you want to be sure that systemic fungicide is there prior to infection because many of them uh, work prophylactically and they'll work very well, so timing is very important. So knowing the life cycle is very important when treating for, for destructive pests, especially vascular uh, pests like emerald ash borer and Dutch elm disease. So the treatment formulation will, uh, will have a very definite effect on uh, how fast uh, you would re you realize distribution in a canopy. Some uh, treatments you could apply well in advance, as I just implied, or some have to be applied when the pest is active. So formulations with short residual need to be coordinated with pest activity. And an example I can give you is we've done work uh, uh, several years ago in our area, which is the northeast, on a new invasive called winter moth. And winter moth is pretty interesting because it will hatch at 50 degrees prior to bud break. So what the uh, first instar larvae will do is kind of crawl between the love 
the bud scales of, of uh, some shade trees, ones we were working on happen to be lindens, and they'll start to mine uh, and eat through the leaf primordia. So that's, so okay, so now when uh, the tree finally leaves out and under heavy infestations, it, com it comes out like uh, alpine lace Swiss cheese. So how do you treat for that? Um, the good thing about uh, winter moth is one generation a year. So something like a, a, a water-soluble quick-acting formulation um, like acephate we have in HJET is ideal. It will go into the tree prior to bud break. You can kind of arrest the development of that insect even before that tree leaves out. So that's one option. Um, the other example is some long residual activity, um, and that involves a different chemistry. Uh, and the example I give you is like triage, or emectin benzoate is a, a very large molecule. It, it tends to have some residual activity, and it's labeled um, actually for two-year control for uh, pests on the, on the label. So the, the time the, that the material remains active in the tree, as I implied, is referred to residual activity. And products can have residual activity that may be days to several years. Um, and if you have an option uh, where you can extend the injection interval, that means um, treating less frequently because you have just inferred on that tree or conferred on that tree protection over time, then that's an advantage. I mean, it's less holes in the tree, and um, it's... It's uh, some of the work that we have done around uh, basically uh, looking at uh, emerald ash borer and triage. We wanted to re reduce the, inter the injection interval. Um, and all, but it's, it's good to have a lot of tools in the toolbox. So things like acephate and dinotefuran are, are great 911 products. Um, they're, they're great for things that do have one generation a year. And that's all you really need to apply them uh, to trees by systemic injection. Um, there are other products like imidacloprid and emectin benzoate, which have intermediate to a very long range of activity for tree protection. So, so the, less, the less events that you can uh, treat the tree, the better the off you are, I think. So the tree phenology is what, what is the tree doing? And um, basically, the guideline is that the uptake of, of, of injection products is highest when the trees are healthy and full leaf. Um, well, basically, that's driven by uh, transpiration. So moisture loss from the leaves uh, drives water up into the system, the tree system, the tree bowl, into the canopy. And uh, so uh, environmental conditions that favor that and that's full leaf, well, it's tree condition, but environmental conditions that favor that moist soils is also important. So some products can cause damage, and the example here that I give is uh, when iron's injected shortly after leaf out. So if you're in, uh, if the leaves are immature, um, they're just, you have active uh, expansion, active shoot extension, you could burn uh, foliage, and it's not only iron, there are other products, it's true, of many injection products. So you, you either need to uh, wait till after that, that canopy <laughs> matures and then treat or treat, as I said, uh, if, the, if there's indications on the label that you can do a fall application or prior to bud break, that would be an advantage. Um, so uh, also, as far as environmental conditions, uh, avoid uh, tre uh, treating drought stress trees or trees in decline. Um, you have to make a judgment as a professional whether that you know, if you're, I don't know if you're an optimist or a realist or a pessimist, but, um, you know, you have to decide whether, what the value of that tree is and whether it's worth treating or not. Um, so environmental factors, the, if, um, if there's no available moisture and uh, that's the, that's the issue with drought and frozen ground, if the ground's frozen, there's no free water, you're not going to get much in terms of transpiration, and transpiration, as I implied, is the driver that moves liquid. It's hydraulic conduction moves liquid up in through the canopy of the tree. So uptake is most rapid when there's sufficient soil moisture, 
low humidity, light wind, moderate temperatures. That's when the stomates are, are open. And uh, that expedites um, actually injection uptake into the trait. But it, to a point. So when things are very hot, uh, when temperatures get very high, those stomates tend to shut down and um, your injection uptake is reduced. And there's also this uh, side consequence of increased uh, risk of fuller injury. So, um, and what is high temperatures? Uh, it's basically under 90 degrees. So once you're above 90 degrees, that's very hot. So I would avoid injecting in high temps. So usually uptake is faster in the morning. This is especially true with conifers, but in the afternoon, after the heat of day has gone by, the stomates will open again, and you get this resumption of uptake in last, uh, late afternoon and early evening. So that's just something to put in your back pocket. If you need to get a job done. Take a long lunch and come back. So administering injections, um, assess tree health, inspect the lower trunk. So what you're really looking for is any defects or injuries to the trunk flare, uh, some people call it a root flare. Um, so you want to avoid any, uh, any areas that you feel that are, have defect or decay in lower uh, trunk or, or root flare. Inspect the canopy for dieback or symptoms of stress. It, it uh, will help to, for you to evaluate whether these are good candidates for treatment. Uh, measuring the tree. Uh, m most labels are based on tree diameter at breast height, which is four and a half feet or 1.6 meters above the ground. If you use a diameter tape, what a diameter tape does is gives you the girth of the tree, but, it, but, you're, measure but you're taking a diameter tape and you're actually measuring circumference. It does the calculation for you. And what it does is it divides that uh, circumference by 3.14 to give you the diameter. If you're using a standard tape, and not a diameter tape, then you have to do the division yourself and divide it by um, basically pi 3.14 to calculate the diameter. So you follow the pesticide label and instructions for the injection device. Sometimes it's the injection device because it's loaded with pesticide, as in the case of capsules, preloaded capsules, to determine your dose. Sometimes it's the number of capsules. Sometimes it's loading, uh, loading your microinfusion uh, device with the product. With some injection devices, no mixing is required. Some formulations, no mixing is required. When mixing is required, make the injection solution up uh, before drilling the tree. So what you really want to do is have your, your equipment, your, your macro in, infusion or your micro infusion system ready for the tree. And this is particularly important in resinous conifers. So if you um, drilled all your holes in resinous conifers and then loaded your dose and then tried to make your application, you may be dealing with a lot of resin. Uh, rather, if you do it the other way around, there's an advantage because all you do is um, you drill plug, if you're using plugs, and then you insert your uh, injector and start the infusion one site at a time and you'll have greater success. If using material that requires the dilution, ensure that the water is free of impurities. And this has a lot to do with uh, pH. Some chemistries are actually um, uh, at high pH. They're, they're, they're made inactive. They don't play well in high pH or alkaline or basic environments. And uh, that should be on the label. I'll give you some examples. Acetate is one, acetractin is another. They like low pH environments. Um, injection location, you s uh, select the injection sites, uh, the, the product labels can give you some indications, the in injection device will as well. The number of sites will vary depending on the method. Typically, you're placing sites uh, near the base of the tree from four to eight inches apart. Space them evenly. The only exception is if there are wounds to the base of the tree, you want to avoid those wound wounded areas. and uh, you you generally do not want to inject any closer than four inches apart just to minimize. Um, it says coalescence of compartmentalization. That just means you want to minimize uh, any um, 
internal uh, internal uh, defects within the tree. So uh, the further apart they are, the less likely you're going to get coalescence um, than uh, the, the two injection sites coalescing. So um, so further apart is better to a point, and we generally recommend anywhere from four to eight inches. So injections, again, should be made into healthy sapwood tissues, avoid damage decayed areas. If a hole is inadvertently drilled into decayed tissue, find another location and drill a new hole. Uh, root or trunk flares are the preferred location for injections because they allow for rapid uptake, good wound closure, and uniform distribution in the canopy. Why is that? Well, the lower the tree, the, you know, lower on the tree, the closer you are to the roots, and there is redundancy within the tree, but the roots basically distribute uh, water and solutes uniformly throughout the canopy. So the closer to the roots you are, the better off you are in terms of uniform distribution in the canopy. So dr drilling injection holes, your drill bit should be sharp. Um, we, we use high helix or brad point drill bits uh, because what we want are drill bits that cut and don't rip. So you want clean, cut, rapid uh, cutting into the uh, wood of the uh, tree. The drill angle can, is important. I, you can drill anywhere from perpendicular to the tree tissues or to a slight angle. It depends on the uh, particular product and methodology you're using. I tend to favor perpendicular to the tree tissues. It's a, it's a lower injury profile. Uh, Drill, the drill hole depth should be determined by basically the tools that you're using, but in part by the, the tree type that you are actually injecting into, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but the drill depth, uh, actually you have to drill through the bark and then into the sapwood. So when we talk about depth, generally we, don't, we ignore the bark, so we're talking about the active sapwood. So if these holes are too shallow, you can get leakage um, with your injector tip or plug. If they're too deep, it's causing unneeded wounding. So for ring porous trees, things like oak, elm, and ash, they tend to have large vessels for uptake, as I showed you a little bit earlier. But uh, the more recent wood that's laid down is the most active xylem for uptake. That's particularly true for white oak. Um, so generally, you want to drill shallower or just the depth or slightly more than the, the depth of your injection port. For diffuse porous trees with, with smaller, um, smaller vessels, you can drill deeper, anywhere from three quarters to an inch and a half. And conifers, uh, their, their sapwood tends to be at least uh, two inches thick, sometimes more. And you're drilling anywhere from uh, a half inch typically to two or three inches into the tree. Um, so I have it here a little illustration on the left. There's a transverse sectional view of a red oak. What I did here was actually drilled into the heartwood and then injected a red dye. Um, the bot, the picture immediately left, lower left, is the vertical view, the longitudinal view of that. So you can see that I drilled into it. Um, the Heartwood is inactive; it doesn't really move product. But the so drilling deeper is not always better. Uh, so know your species. Um, and then in the upper right, you'll see where the cambium is. Uh, the infusion legs and that that port would have delivered anywhere that the, the system is active. And you can see there's a clear there's a clear channel there before you see the the red or the pink in the system. Okay, so drilling uh, injection holes. Uh, as I implied earlier, hole depth is measured from the cambium into the wood. Bark measurement is not included in the measurement. Uh, and if hardwood is evident in the drill shavings, the hole is probably too deep. With resinous conifers, the injection must be performed quickly and high pressure to prevent resin flow into the injection hole and equipment. We're doing some work these days with looking at late season injections. There was some work done in Korea that um, injected uh, some, some conifers, some pines, um, and tour, when temps started to drop, the resin flow was reduced and application was a little more uh, 
was more rapid, if you will. So it's something to think about. It's, it's something that we are actually investigating ourselves. So in, in drilling injection holes, what you really want to do is cut into the tree. So set your, set your drill to the lowest speed, allow for, for clean cuts, and open wood vessels. What you want to avoid is excessive heat, which are dr dull drill bits, uh, and you want to avoid cauterization. Cauterization is burning and closing those vessels. Um, that's going to impede uptake. So you drill the in entire depth kind of smoothly in one, in, in one uh, <coughs> push or drive into the, the tree, if you will, and then remove it immediately. Don't spin it in the hole because that just increases the likelihood of burning and including those tissues. The depth, as illustrated in the bottom, is based on uh, the tools that you're using. Uh, generally, that could uh, the diameter could be could range from seven thirty seconds to five eighths of an inch. Actually, that should be three eighths. So um, uh, the inject uh, injecting the tree, inserting the injection port. There are a couple of different methods. Some use nozzles, needles, or tips. You insert the injection port into the hull. Uh, to just to make sure the, the solution goes into the tree with, with minimal or no leakage. And this illustration shows that, uh, with, uh, this is our recommendations for a stinger tip, where uh, it, it kind of fits, it's tapered so it fits uh, snugly below the bark and allows for, uh, for the uh, infusion to occur. Uh, too deep it tends to reduce, you get a little more resistance for the anatomical reasons we kind of uh, discussed, uh, and then too shallow, you have a situation where you can get leakage out. Uh, using plugs um, or and infusion capsules, some uh, injection systems recommend plugs. They could be plastic, metal, um, and you set them uh, in, into the drill hole, and then you can use a specialized tip uh, to inject through it. There's a cutaway. Uh, lower right hand corner showing the, uh, a needle into a cutaway plug. Um, when that um, needle pierces the permeable septum, it actually, uh, you can deliver the material through um, the gap in the plug or behind that uh, seal. And then when you pull it out, it self closes so that you don't get any leakage. So setting that properly in the tree is, is important so that you can get the product to remain in the tree without any leakage out. When using plugs or infusion castles, you set them with the top just below the cambium, and that will do a couple things. One, it will uh, deliver material into the sapwood, into the active uh, vessels or tracheids, uh, as the case may be, uh, but uh, prevent movement into the phloem. So that cambial area, the lateral cambium, the inner phloem, the inner bark, that area is subject to, um, it's not going to move anything, uh, and it's subject to injury. So you want to be careful how you uh, do your applications so that you apply it to the sapwood. You, you all know that active uh, sapwood is functional when it's non-living. So the, the vessels or, and tracheids that conduct water and solutes are not, uh, not living. So they tend to to, they'll react, there's certainly reactions, coated reactions that occur, but that is the least uh, um, invasive way to actually inject uh, trees efficiently. With the top of the plug or cap at this location, the wound wood responses that occur, um, that uh, occur from the, later, from the lateral cambium, which is meristematic tissue, uh, it can close over and regrow. So, we all know trees don't heal, but they're generating systems. They can regrow, uh, regrow and close, close over that wound. The optimal size for a tree species, it really depends. There are several different sizes from, as I applied earlier, 730 seconds diameter up to 3 8 uh, diameter. Um, it's, it's basically what, what tree species are you treating, what is your preference, what is the time frame uh, based on the the kind of material you're putting into the tree. So there's some factors that you have to address. Uh, in some cases, plugs allow for multiple injections into the same hole. 
and this is true of palms. So palms are unlike, uh, palms aren't really trees, we, we call them palm trees, but they're actually large plants, uh, they're monocots, they don't have, very few have lateral cambium, um, so when you drill a hole, it's going to remain uh, there. But, uh, so that's the bad news. The good news is that you can often re-inject in the same site over a number of years. Now, uh, why is this important? Uh, University of Florida has done a lot of work with um, phytoplasma, lethal yellows of palm, uh, and uh, a new disease, as I implied earlier, Texas Phoenix palm decline has come into Florida, pretty much through the middle sections of Florida. Uh, OTC uh, is recommended for yellows, phytoplasma diseases, and that has to be applied. Uh, University of Florida recommends once every three to four months on the reapplication. So using the same site has an advantage. If you can use that same site for that year, it reduces the amount of injection holes in the palm. So uh, priming and purging the, the system. Uh, when you use the microinfusion device uh, that has multiple injection tips, we recommend that you purge it of all the air. And the reason for that is that you can have an inconsistent uptake around the bowl of a tree when you have uh, embolisms within, uh, within your lines and you could get uneven distribution and this is about minimizing that variability. So determining the application pressure, the pressure will depend on the device you're using. It uh, also depends on the tree species but most devices operate between 15, some are lower, the capsules, microinjective capsules may be on the order of 2 to 5 PSI, but most of these microinfusion or macroinfusion devices are between 15 and 200 PSI. Uh, the excessive pressures, anything above that is generally not needed, so you've got to be careful a little bit with pressure. You don't want to, you know, blow the bark off trees if you're injecting or pressurizing an injector tip and it's too shallow, that means it's in that region between the sapwood and inner bark. You have to be a little careful with that, so be sure you got that set correctly. Um, too low pressure will slow your application time. So getting that right doesn't take much, but I think that's the most technical part of tree injection is where you put in this material and how you're pressurizing it so you reduce that injury profile to an acceptable level. So administering the treatment to ensure maximum treatment effectiveness, administer the full dose. Um, so dosages are on the label. Um, manufacturers spend some time uh, testing doses that are effective. High volume treatments or treatments applied with low pressure may require more time. Um, that, may, that is true with uh, treatments that use systemic fungicides. Um, you may have had familiarity with Arbitec that's used uh, to protect elms. Same is true of propiconazole uh, that, are, that are diluted. So that higher volume, although it cuts the viscosity of the products or cuts phytotoxicity of the products, as the case may be, it takes more time. It doesn't overcome a microinjection, but it's necessary. You're following the product label instructions. So the application should remain, the applicator should remain on site especially when you're using capsules or if you're using these micro-injections because it's a liability otherwise. So mm -hmm. remove the dis uh, disposal capsules when the material has been taken up. Do not leave uh, the injection devices unattended. Uh, you're responsible as the applicator to monitor it. Most uh, micro-injectors are designed so you can see or feel when the solution is not moving well into the tree. And that, in that case, you can relocate that particular injection site to a new area to complete the injection. Um, cleaning and maintenance is important. Manufacturers will um, actually give you recommendations or instructions to uh, uh, maintain your equipment. That's important, especially if you're using different products in the same injector. Um, and this is typically flushing the system. Uh, wound position and severity, so wounds higher in the trunk tend to be more severe than at the base. Wounds with bright, clean surfaces are usually associated with little or no decay. 
The image on the left is a cross section of an ash tree that we treated. Um, actually, uh, this this autopsy was done four years after treatment. The, the yellow arrow points to a compartmentalized zone. The tree grew um, grew very well after injection. So that was one injection done over a four-year period in this study, which was cl it closed over nicely. So um, uh, people asked, you know, injections kill trees? No, what we were going after was emerald ash borer, and we effectively did that. Um, I had some trouble doing some autopsies because people did not want their live trees taken down, especially in, in uh, East Lansing, where we did the study. On the right is a hemlock, and that's approximately three years after injection. Uh, we injected near the base of the tree. See a cutaway. This is a longitudinal section in this case of the arb plug. It's pretty much encased within the tree, and you can see the profile there. So uh, the, tr the tree actively grew over the injection site, which is kind of nice. Um, use sharp drill bits. Um, uh, so you're cutting into the tissue which is much more effective not only in application but in reducing uh, injury to the tree. So um, you're reducing oxidative and, and the opportunity for decay within that uh, um, injection site. And um, if you, uh, as I said earlier, if you dr drill holes associated with, with major roots um, and as low as possible, that's probably the best case scenario. I know you can't always do that, but that's one of the recommendations. So small shallow holes cost least amount of injury. Very narrow holes, deep in the trunk, um, tend not to cause injury. There are exceptions. It's when uh, they, if the tree is very small and um, they intersect, then injury will be greater. If you get coalescence, they kind of blend together. Large deep holes, uh, <laughs> this is the worst case scenario maybe, but if you have large holes and you drill them deep, uh, into affected wood, and you can't always see where infection columns reside in the tree, and that's part of the problem, especially older trees. So th this is the recommendation for, you know, being circumspect and how deep you actually go with the caveat that, okay, if it's a conifer, I'm going deeper than in, in a, a, a ring porous tree, but it's, again, your discretion and your experience that's going to drive that. So straight holes cause less injury. The size, angle, and depth of the hole affects internal injury. For that reason, I kind of like to go with um, perpendicular to the, the stem tissues. That lower in, uh, image is a, a, an ash that shows a very restricted um, uh, kind of shadow of, of a product that we tested and put in. If you look around, I excise the tissue around the plug, you'll see that the wood is clear. You had no phytotoxicity toxicity issues around that injection site. So had we left this to grow over, it would have done very well. Uh, and in this case, uh, you'll see a different story. Uh, as I uh, alluded to alluded earlier, genes play a role. So um, compartmentalization responses are under genetic control, or moderate gen genetic control anyway. So uh, you have situations where trees will be strong compartmentalizers. That means they'll isolate the, the wound and they'll go their merry way. Some are weak compartmentalizers. So you have to know your species, but it goes beyond that. It's actually um, clonal species. You'll, if they're clonal, that means that they're propagated asexually. So a lot of trees that are in the nursery industry are, are made that way. Then you can have a pretty good sense of the cultivar reaction. In woodland situations, a little bit different because now you're dealing with seed stock and uh, un unless it's a seed orchard. Um, but if you're dealing with uh, natural, then the same species, whether it's a maple or an ash, could have differences in genetic response to injury. So certain chemical formulations, they're phytotoxic to sapwood cause more injuries compared to chemistries with low phytotoxicity. And that's what the images on the right kind of illustrate. The far right, you saw a little bit earlier, is a formulation that was applied three years prior. Uh, in this case, 
it was done with a microinjection capsule. The product um, was very cytotoxic to the tissues. This autopsy was made three years uh, later with, no, with very little response. Just above and below the arrows, you see a little bit of uh, uh, new tissue developing. On the left, I mean, they're both ash trees. On the left is another product, in this case, that, was, that happened to be imidacloprid that we put in three years after we got uh, healthy growth and, and, and closing over. So your formulation is going to drive it, your method may drive it, and certainly your situation will drive it. The uh, ash on the right was a woodland tree, uh, the one on the left was a street tree. So just be aware of that, I'm just showing the breadth of uh, different responses and same species in different situations. So I just want to acknowledge that uh, a lot of the comments today were based on best management practices, the second edition, uh, published by, uh, for tree injection, published by the International Society of Arboriculture. And I just want to thank Tom Smiley for working with us uh, for the second edition uh, and the edits uh, in the newest edition of the BMPs. So thank you very much. And if you have questions, I'll take them now.